Yeah. You're in a bit. Right? About it, February yeah. last year. And uh, uh, I, I know and understand Scuttlebutt fairly well and that community. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, I'm interested in Hollow Chain, and I'm interested in the idea of Hollow REA. And um, Sid and I talked for the first time. What was that? A couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm really here to just uh, learn, I guess, learn a bit more about Hollow and what you guys are thinking, and see what's up. Cool. That's awesome. Um, does anyone else? Um, yeah, just and. Thanks. Great, great to have you here, Graham. Um, for Thank the you. others here, I've also started recording. And does anyone else who's, you know, you've been here before, do you have anything specific you'd like to get out of today's session? So Sam or Gregory or Arya, anyone? Okuma? Hey, Sid, it's Greg. Um, hey. hey Aria Bata and I are mm -hmm. going to be taking notes and reporting back to the European base time hack along on what oh. happens on this hack along. Oh, nice. So we're going to be reporting. Yeah, it's going to be good. They have some good questions and yeah, I'm, you know, trying to see the similarities too between the systems. So it'd be good. Very cool. Can you elaborate any more on the specifics of the question the European contingent has or the, when you say the two platforms, you're talking Hollow Aria and Chimera, are you or? Or um, also leap, they're heavy on leap, yep. and um, and so yeah, they they just wanted to report back honestly, like, hey, what what are the cool things that are coming out of that hack along? You know, could you have five minutes in the beginning of their hack along to report on on you know what we find? And he and I are both non devs, and they like that too from that perspective because ultimately it's supposed to be you know guys like us that will be able to use those tools that that everybody's demonstrating. Mm. That is a nice practice. Cool. Like, do you want to sh spend a minute or two just sharing what came up in yesterday's hack along in Europe? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, it might be a question for next time, but I'm wondering if there might be uh, some things we can hear about Leap as well, because I'm not very much across that project. Yeah, yeah. Today, uh, they were going through kind of uh, anchor first and data first scenarios, um, been working on profiles. Um, and then Guillaume is also, you know, and it, it, all of these subjects are touched on, you know, the different things, the mutual credit system has been, mm -hmm. you know, discussed a lot in the past few weeks. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, um, I've been chatting with Hidayat and Anastasia about this, um, but there might be some overlap between what we've been exploring with modularity here. And so one of the things we're trying to develop is like a very modular likes DNA. So basically, you know, a ratings DNA for leap, which would be very cool. And so we've actually started some work on that. So maybe I'm going to chat with yeah, Maybe we chat about, we bring that up in the next hack along. Um, let's see. Cool. Um, maybe we could dive with that. Just dive straight into today's topic. Uh, I think everyone here has, watched either watched the the videos of CRISPR Chimera and Holo Arie or has some kind of insight or background into them. So I think we can start with that assumption. Um Philip and Pospi, do you guys have anything in mind um for a structure for this? Um yeah I've done quite a lot since two weeks ago. Uh mm -hmm. we'd run a the demo and show you what I've, what I've built. I'm keen to yeah, see how yeah. we can integrate REA into what I'm building as a pluggable thing. Yeah, Bosby, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, that sounds like a good way. Um, I've, I've got a list, I'll put it in the chat. I made a bit of a list of things I would like to talk about, but I think it still makes sense for Philip to start with a bit of an update on where he's at and then we can dive into the deeper parts of how we might leverage things and integrate them. Cool. All right, should we do that then? Yep. <clears throat> uh, can you turn on screen sharing, please, Sid? It should be on. Is it not? No, it's in a meeting. You have to turn it on every, every meeting now. Oh, sorry. There you go. Just 
finished my new website, by the way. <laughs> Here. <clears throat> right, so um, done a lot more work on the uh, profiles and personas part. Um, most of that, or actually all of it, apart from saving profiles, is now in Holochain. Um, <clears throat> and each DHT that you um, set up, you can add profile to it uh, in, the, in the build process, but well, in the design section. And what that does then is then when you start using that DHT, the list of people changes. So you can see here, I've got uh, Mark, Arthur and myself in this group. If I go and switch to a different one, such as Origins, see how the list has changed. <coughs> uh, so all of these people now have a profile in the Origins DHT which means it's now contextual. Uh, and then we can go and look at um, some other apps and they change there as well. But here, yeah, you get the idea. Um, and now each person, uh, I'm getting their agent ID back as well. This is just for my benefit at the moment, but the purpose of that is to be able to send direct messages um, very soon. Um, I changed around the way the profiles and stuff work. So now you can click personas at the top here. And this will retrieve your personas out of Holochain. So you can see I've got three here, uh, music, Holochain and personal. And if we go and look at my profiles, these are the ones that are attached to applications. I changed the UI so it shows you the value or like the actual the thing that's stored in there. So here you can see I've got like a handle and an avatar. And this one's got a profile picture as well. And if you want to edit them, you can click here and change these so this will pick up all the avatars that are in all of my different personal personas uh, this one picks up all my different um, text so i can change that and save and goes back to there um, <clears throat> so that's all pretty much done now so you know, personas and profiles fairly well managed but i i like it this way it's cool uh, just a reminder everything has help so if you hit the question mark anywhere, it tells you exactly what to do on each on each page, and that's all contextual. Um, right, what else have I done? Um, right, so the cloning process works now. So if we go and look at um, CRISPR, See, I've segregated these into applications and parts. The idea of that is that an application is a bit too complicated to clone at this point, and I'm going to leave that for the moment. Uh, and individual parts are what you clone, and then you put all your parts together like a chimera, and you make yourself an application. So <clears throat> if we go, um, you'll see here I've got a bunch of new ones. So I've just been working on this tags one on the bottom here. Uh, I um, found some really cool images on the internet for some things. Uh, I really like this one, the DNA with the data in it. It's really cool. By the way, everything's Creative Commons uh, and there is a credits file in the app. In here somewhere. Uh, which details where everything came from. So everybody gets their, uh, gets their credit where it's due. Um, Philip, could you share real quick what origin, like each one of these part projects are? Sure. Yeah. Right. So Origins is a very basic one, um, and it's just a um, WYSIWYG text editor that you put in a list. Um, so we can look at that. So these part editors work now. Right, so uh, everything is uh, all responsive as well. So it's a little bit difficult, but I actually did this and you, you can do it on your, on your phone. <laughs> um, oh yeah, that was the other thing too. So I've actually had this running with uh, two laptops and a phone, all with different agents and all interacting in individually. So, so you can do things like, um, so I've got this like who is uh, control now. 
and it tells you who the person was that actually created the entry. Oh, a bit warm for you, is it, Sid? It's bloody freezing down here. <laughs> um, <clears throat> right, so the part editor all works. So you can see I've got an origin, which is the actual entry, origins, which is the list. So there's a list of things here. And then the store file, which is for Vuex, and this is where all of the interaction with Holochain occurs. So um, if we go down and look at the actions you can take, so you can do like, you know, get an agent address, um, fetch your profiles, fetch origins, all that kind of stuff. Um, previously, I had a, the idea of how, like having your running Holochain conductor and a development one. Uh, I've kind of come to the conclusion that we don't actually need that because what I'm in the process of doing now is the um, instance ID, which at this in this case is origins, which is just for the one. Uh, I'm about to now have a way of managing uh, lots of different instances of the same DHT or similar DHTs. And that'll all be so that what's going to happen is you'll get a, a, a GUID for the instance ID, you'll be able to name it, and it will be associated to a UI as well. So then you'll be able to, so like you can have multiple um, multiple UI instances running with different DHTs. Right, so we can edit this. So if we go, uh, let's go, should we change something? Let's make. Oh, let's change the the uh, help. Right, we just changed that there. Oh, man, this bloody video thing the other way. Right, uh, and if I save that, <coughs> and if we don't look at the help on here, let's go. There you go. So you can actually do things, you know, so if I, um, I undo that. I'm just gonna get rid of all your faces. This video thing's taken up too much room. Um, and press save there. So you get this idea of like, you can actually edit um, the your application as you're building it inside Chimera, which is kind of cool. The only thing, uh, oh, so one thing that happens is, so you can edit the UI fine, that's not a problem, but if you change the state like this, so if we go and change something in here and go, uh, so on, it'll um, causes a full refresh for the app, which is actually fine because if you're using Visual Studio, you have to do that anyway, because to get the, to update the state. So um, there you go. Uh, yeah, so that was the big, big thing for the week was the uh, being able to edit inline, uh, updating the um, the way that the DHT profiles work, and being able to do demos. So, um, if we look at some of these parts, oh, sorry, some of these parts that I built. So, because we've refreshed, it's had to go back to Holochain and, and rehit that list, which, as you can see, is terribly embarrassingly slow but it will be fixed up soon in Holochain 2020. All right, so Origins is just a very simple one. There go, smaller, that's better. Um, you can um, get some details on them by clicking this little MDI details link here. And again, help everywhere. Um, curated fields now. So what this is for is for the personas and profiles. So if we go and look at uh, personas <clears throat> and edit one of these, see these this list of fields here? This comes from the curated list. And the idea of this is that um, all the different apps that are using personas and profiles will have the same set of uh, curated fields and there will be a custom fields as well. So you're not restricted. But the idea of that is, is that all of the different apps will have the same field name. So when you do profiles, which um, will get automatically populated, 
So if I do a profile and it says um, handle and avatar, and it's a new app, um, it gets automatically populated with what it can find in my list of personas for um, persona and brand. And the reason it can do that nice and quickly, or can do it at all, is because it's the same set of fields in the profile, right? So the profile list um, in the profile editor has the same list of fields. So that's what curated fields is for. Um, Freckles was, is a, just a, a simple app um, where you can, it's just a list of, um, uh, list of items and it's just a busy, very, it was, it's, it's a simple app to, to work with. Um, but it's going to be the uh, basis for a uh, chat app. Not a, like a, you know, like a Facebook Messenger kind of thing where people can post each other messages. And what's really fascinating about this is that if we go and look at the, let's go and look at the code for it. Uh, in the zone, right, uh, I added a new um, permission or a new role for permissions. And that is that if I, if, if the founder is the only one who can create it, <clears throat> then it's, you know, the progenitor role, we call it founder because nobody knows what progenitor actually means. Um, that means that the person who started the DHT is the only one who's allowed to write in it or, or update or delete which is what you'd expect for like a, your private chat that you're, you know, or private thing that you're posting into. However, if you want to have a, like a group chat, you want to have like four or five people who are allowed to post into it, then you make it anyone. Right? So the, the really nice thing about this is that with the same, exactly the same code, I don't have to change anything. I just changed the conditions for the permissions. It goes from being, you know, private to group and all this kind of thing. So. And this is where we need the instances so that I can create a new instance of the Freckle DHT that has these permissions and somebody else could create another one. So the idea is that um, you could be using Freckles and go, oh, actually, you know, I want to start a group one. How do I do that? Well, if, if there isn't a group DHT already hanging around, you can just go and create your own one. Right, we're talking about parts, aren't we? Right, so that was Freckles. Um, <clears throat> and I'll get to the cloning thing soon. But so notes uh, is... I think notes and tasks you've covered. Yeah, they're all the same. Yep. Yeah. Uh, cool. Right, so projects is this list of projects. Mm. Um, parts and applications. And tags is one I was working on this morning. And I've built everything I'm about to show you with tags, I built with this. I haven't touched Visual Studio at all, except when I made the occasional type of compilation error, which I had to go and fix, but that's fine. So this is a tags control where you can pick tags, or you can write new ones, uh, that kind of thing. Um, you can edit things in line as well which if you save it, it just goes to there. But if you, oops, if I edit it and <laughs> edit it, edit, right, there we go, and change it back and hit enter, it edits it and saves it and puts it into your list as well. Now, this is a new pattern that I haven't built before because what, it, what you have to have is the full list of is the full list of all the options, which is this list of tags here, and then the things that are selected for the thing that it's attached to. So, you know, the, the, um, the uh, item that this, this tag is attached to has selected techno, but there's all these other ones that are in the list. There you can have. So this is a new pattern. And if you think about it like, um, you know, like in GitHub when you assign, um, uh, assign a task to somebody, You've got a full list of people, but you select one or two people, whatever, you know, a selection of people. So this is a, a new pattern I'm developing. So there's no actual code generation for the back end just yet. But the funny thing is that the, the variation is very, very minor. <laughs> so I'm mm -hmm. trying to figure out if I can actually use the existing pattern and just put a, a condition in it. 
Um, right, yeah, so I built all this with, um, with, this, with this tool, uh, which was kind of fun. So the idea of the tags is that you'll be able to tag any item you like. So the same as, you know, you can put tasks and ratings and things on things, you'll be able to put tags on them as well. Mm. And so um, the, my main use case for this at this point is I want to be able to tag all the instances. So there'll be, I'm going to build an instance instances um, project very soon. And that'll list out every single DHT that you've got with its instance ID and its name. And then you'll be able to tag those entries. So the idea of that is that then you'll be able to do things like say, you know, this is a work entry or a personal entry or you know, instance or whatever it might be, family, family, friends, you know, tag it all. And then that's going to lead into doing things like advertising, but not advertising, not the horrible advertising, um, inverted, where I'm the one who gets to decide mm. what I want to see and I ask to be given information. And what happens is, is that you get a UI component from an advertiser. Mm. It's got some sort of algorithm in it. And then you will say, right, um, I want you, I want all these instances with this tag or these tags to run, to be connected to this UI. And it will give, it will come back with some information that by, you know, analyzing, going through the data, whatever it does, it gives me the answer. Nothing to do with the, there's no, sending to the advertiser or anything like that. It's just mm. purely insight into my own information based on tagged mm. instances. Mm. And so just to clarify, each person has their own DHT with their own tags, right? Like that's how. If you want, yeah. <laughs> up to you, man. <laughs> if we want to share tags, we can share tags because it's just another DHT. Mm. Mm. Which is where all of these uh, things have a title so that you can, so we're going to look at something like, um, uh, let's look at the Kanban for, I don't know, notes or something. <coughs> um, okay. Come on. No, no one. Let's have a look. What have I done? Broken it. Oh, that's right. Uh, I changed the name of the. Tell you what, as far as finding and fixing files, Visual Studio is shit. How do you find all the instances of a word in a in a project and change it or in a folder? It's supposed to do that, but it doesn't work. Anyway, um, fix it, please. this is because I got rid of the dev well, possibility. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so another thing I did too with the demo stuff now, which is the Triorama setup, mm. um, it sets up all of the conductors and all that kind of stuff. And as you can see, there's quite a lot of them now. <laughs> Um, so currently I'm running all of these DNAs for seven different agents, I think, six different agents. Mm. Uh, and it just sets up a few things in here. And then I've got uh, setup files. So um, you can just call Holotain Connection then and then call your zone from this file. So that means that you don't have to keep restarting the whole thing. You can just keep adding new data or whatever you like. Um, and this is part of the process of moving away from dev holochain connection and having two different holochains. I'm actually just going to run my development stuff in the holochain conductor because it's on its own instance. So, you know, I can install it, uninstall it, install it, uninstall it every time I make a new one. And um, so I can install, so I'm working on the tags one, right? I could install the tags DHT and then run this file, punch all the data into it for, for what I'm doing and see how it all works. Um, yeah, so it's working so great. That's Did we have, Bosby, do you want to jump in with questions as they come up? Um, yeah, I think there's, 
there's kind of two directions we can take this conversation from here. Um, like we could go deeper into Chimera and some of the internals of how it works and explore whether it's got the flexibility to do more powerful templating that I think we need. Um, or I guess I also sense there's kind of a different direction here in terms of where we're heading in, in how we see modularity, partic particularly in terms of like um, the way people interact between networks. Uh, and that might be worth talking about too. What do you mean? Anyone though? Want to... like... Well, we can start there. That one sounds... <laughs> well, let's just do one thing. And then uh, um, we'll hand yeah. over. I just want to show you how the cloning works, right? So yep. um, what we're going to do is build a new a new part. So this button here, clone. Uh, what are we going to call it? Let's call it events. So do this. Um, no, let's call it gigs because that's what I'm actually going to build. No, this one. Good job. 32 gigs around isn't enough to run seven conductors, apparently. Clone. <clears throat> we now have a new app somewhere. There we go. Like gigs, right? Cool. Now the reason that the image didn't change is because you can't put much in the wasm at the moment in the Rust version. It dies really easy. So I've hacked it to hard code, just like a path, and it just pulls the image out of there. Grind, grind, grind. Come on, come on, come on. Uh, the new version in 2020 is super fast. Everything's less than a millisecond. So, yeah, give this. So, so I've now created this new uh, project called Gigs. Uh, we can go and look at the zone for it. See, it's all updated with gigs, 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 and it has a thing in here called a gig. Uh, it had the profile attached to it as well, so that's why that's there. And you can see everything's updated. So we can go and you know, generate that file, but we've done that we don't need to show you that. The really cool thing is, is I can go up here and go to uh, part editor. And you see I took a copy of the origins app that we were looking at which is just that list. And now I've got a new one called gigs. So I can change this around. Let's say we don't need this at the top here. And so <clears throat> right, cool. So now we can start editing and building this app uh, in Chimera, in CRISPR. Um, and that all works. So that's been really fun, actually. So what I'm doing is because I'm using this to build the stuff that I'm using, I'm building in stuff like I've just started uh, working out how to do keyboard shortcuts and stuff for here. Uh, this is actually a view plugin or view mode for CodeMirror. So it's a nice little formatter. This one's in JavaScript. So the formatting is pretty good. I found that there's a key bindings set up as well. So I can set up the same key bindings in Code Mirror that I use in Visual Studio. So that'll be um, much more convenient uh, as well. Uh, I think I'm pretty much done there. I'm curious, does that templating cloning stuff happen using the source code template stuff in Chimera or is it a hollow chain layer thing? It's purely my, purely my work. So yep. 
um, the way the templates work. So what happens is that the it copies the, so what it did is it copied this origins folder with these three um, files in it, and made a new one called git. Right, so it's actually writing to my disk and that's why it's restarting. And then all the DNA template stuff, which is where you change all the permissions and the fields and all that stuff, comes out of the templates down here. So, yeah. Oh, there it is, templates. <laughs> right, so that's what it comes out of here. So this one is the origins template. <clears throat> and you can see it's got all the bits and pieces in here. So the, because it's a, it's a lot more than just templating, right? It's because I can actually uh, modify on the fly what my DNA is supposed to look like. I've broken up the DNA code into lots of little pieces. So this is a declaration. So if I'm using multiple entry types, the output uses this multiple times in the, in the mod file. And what I mean by that is if we look at the code here, yeah, we see that um, uh, it's got a lib file here. Yeah. Right, so the lib file here, you see it's got gig and profile because it's got both of the profile type or both of the entry types in there. And if we go and do something like change the permissions uh, and say that no one's allowed to do it. So the from from there, and if we look in the lib file, we'll see that the no one's allowed to delete, so there is no delete function anymore. But remember that we left the delete on the permission validation to make sure that even if someone did try to hack through somehow, I'm still not sure how anybody would do that. Um, but, but the they still can't, it still won't validate because no one's allowed to delete. So the templating is custom fill code. I think you might have answered one of my questions about it, um, which is. Like there's, my experience with templating is you always end up needing some proper quote unquote templating system. Like you're going to have to rebuild pug or handlebars or EJS or something oh, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, um, this is not so, so much templating. Even though well, it seems like it does the conditional, the conditional side of it, which is one part. So, you know, there'd be requirements in REA where it's like, if you've got these two modules selected, then inject this extra bit of code as well to bind them together. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like you've got that capability in here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and is that, that's like custom coded in the editor in the, in the way the generation happens, or is it something that the templater has access to? You can, well, you can build your own templates. Uh -huh. uh, which is what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm, I've only got one at the moment because I've, I've built all those other apps with just the one template. Um, but I'm going to need a new one fairly soon, I can tell. So that will be to so be able to pick multiple templates. And then in your um, uh, in the project setup, Yeah, so in these, when, when you set up a project, you tell it what the zone template is and also the entry type template. <clears throat> so at the moment, you can't edit these things in the zone modeler yet because I'm still trying to bed down what this actually looks like before I try and mess around with editing it. But the idea is, is that yeah, we'll have multiple templates for the zone and also each individual entry type depending on what it's for. Yeah, the nicer thing I was hoping for with the Zome templater and designer was um, being able to kind of have some higher level um, options for links that manage all the lower level complexity for you. Um, 
in whole rea the biggest one at the moment is like whether you want to put two things in the same dna or a separate dna and having a different link structure for a remote link versus a local link um but i think there'll be some other differences you meet like you know there might be ones where you might want to actually select you know this is a write heavy workload so i want this type of structure versus this one for a read heavy workload and things um so yeah i'm curious about chimera as a way of like keeping abreast of a best of sorry abreast of best practices that's a mouthful um without having yeah, to actually work through the best practices <laughs> yourself yeah like just being able to have the idea go okay you know, this is the way we were all doing links last week, but someone found there was a, a performance issue with that. And so this is the new way now, but you don't actually have to change any code. You just press a button and all your codes updated with the, the idiomatic version. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that, that's what this is doing. So because it, it comes from, everything comes from the template, all you need to do is update the template and then um, uh, re-export your VHT. Which is what I'll be hopefully doing next week when I'll have my hands on the Holochain 2020 way of building um, zones. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we want to move into how this is different to what I'm doing? <laughs> yeah, sure. Show me what you're doing. Yeah, I've not seen Arik for quite a while. Um, I'll be back in two seconds. Uh, oh, Zoom windows are fun. How's that? I'm using a smaller screen today because my other one was a bit big. Um, That's fine. Is Philip back or has he disappeared for a moment? It's gone off for a minute. What do you mean when you, since we have a minute, uh, what do you mean when we, when you said this might move modularity in a different direction? Is it uh, more the individualistic well, approach as opposed to like a community-based approach? Yeah, that's the short version of mm. the difference I'm seeing. Um, but that's the thing I kind of want to talk back, to, talk to at the moment. Um, this is kind of the easiest place to see it. Yeah, it's um, it comes up for me in looking at those uh, those peer lists on the network chat. Um, like what Philip's doing there seems to be very modal to the collaboration space you're in, and you switch between a collaboration space, you have a different set of peers, but you don't interact between the two networks very much. Mm. Is that fair to say, Philip? Uh, I missed some of that, but um, I can tell you, I don't do any, there's no bridging or anything like that. Every, all, everything I'm doing is completely UI. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So this is, this is some different stuff mm. I'm trying to push for. Um, so this one here, I've got a bunch of DNAs I'm creating at the start here. Um, and these are their identifiers, the second parameter. Um, and these are the, the DNA IDs. So there's like a couple of different instances of agent that are all different networks. Yeah. Um, so this it's is, this is sort of like the global, <laughs> yeah, this is sort of like the global naming space of like, you know, this is, this is the logical network separation in this scenario. Um, but then when you go and look at each agent, um, you see they're, they're sitting in overlapping network bubbles. So this one, these three, DNAs here are kind of part of the same collaboration space that's all the customer's marketplace. Um, and there's these other two here that are quite separate. Like one is a window into the couriers network and another is a window into a, an importer uh, officials network. Um, maybe the export is kind of a, a better example too because they've got their own network that's just a planning space where they coordinate other people. And then this sub network where it's actually got some economic events and observations where they're coordinating a contractor. Um, so there's a few things about this that are kind of limitations at the moment. And I, it's going to be interesting as these calls move on in the following weeks, because we might end up talking about more UI stuff than Holochain stuff in the short term, at least anyway. Um, cause this is all kind of getting into JavaScript and GraphQL and has nothing much to do with Holochain anymore. 
Um, and so there's like the limitations here that when you look at the um, da, 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 when I look at when you look at the actual module that binds to hollow chain um, and you look at say that the agent queries um, at the moment I've got these to do's all through the code base of how to inject the DNA IDs so um, the fact that it's calling agent here and mapping to this agent DNA for this user is just um, kind of coincidental almost at the moment. Um, so there's a couple of things. One is that each logical collaboration space that I'm trying to create in Hollow REA is actually- a Collaboration space? Yeah, like a collaboration space being multiple networks potentially. It could just be one network, but multiple networks all that coordinate together as one logical space. And what do you mean by network? network? <laughs> uh, DNA, sorry, yeah. Right, right. yeah. DHT, um, yeah. Yeah, DHT. So, so yeah, like this is collaboration yeah. space for the customer to do stuff, but it's actually three separate DNAs that are all linked together. Um, and so at the moment, there's like, because of the way that it's coded, there's kind of the idea of a native network where um, the way I'm editing my test harness, when I run GraphQL to queries through this, this customer agent, it'll be running them against these three networks. It won't touch these two. Um, so I need to get to a point where I'm actually injecting these DNA IDs so I can spin up multiple GraphQL APIs to say, you know, this one's for the customer network, this one's for the subcontract network, and someone can actually have access to both GraphQLs. Um, so then it's sort of like you end up with a bunch of Holochain DNAs that sit inside of a GraphQL connection. Um, and I can show you that if you look at the value flows GraphQL repo um, in the schemas folder here, they're all actually separated out into individual modules that mostly bind one to one to a hollow chain module. Um, so like, you know, here's the observation layer, here's the planning layer kind of thing. Um, and the way that my little build system works, which if you were going to integrate REA into Chimera, you'd need to do something similar um, is basically when I, oh, I'll show you in the hollow chain one because it doesn't use them all, so it's more sensible. So we, when you create this scheme here, I tell it which modules I want to be using, um, and it will then create a schema for me that takes all those modules and combines them, but also combines these bridging ones for the pairs that are present. So because I've got agent and observation here, I'm also going to get all these fields that are the agent and observation bindings that join those two DNAs together effectively. Yeah, um, cool. So I find, yeah. I find that quite a nice way to organize my code because it means I've got this really clean file here that tells me specifically the fields that connect those two modules and yeah. that makes um, some development stuff a lot easier. Uh, anyway, so then there's beyond that, um, There's these couple of techniques. One is schema delegation uh, and one is schema stitching. And probably delegation is the more robust, well-traveled one. Um, but it basically gives you this option. Um, and it's, it, it, it's actually, you can kind of ignore all this com complexity in it if you just remember that with GraphQL, the field resolvers are just callbacks. Um, so, you know, I've got a bunch of field resolvers in hollow chain here that, um, you know, so this is for economic event, like it'll go and load an agent up to, to retrieve the provider of that event from the agent DNA and all that kind of stuff. Um, but these are just functions. So you can actually have a schema that has some top level function to query resources. That's just a function that actually calls over multiple sub schemas and, you know, intelligently pulls records in and orders them and paginates them and stuff. Um, and that's what these delegate to schema functions do. So you can kind of just say, I want to have a top level schema that's actually composed of like, um, well, let's have a look at these ones here. That's actually composed of two separate collaboration spaces. One is the exporter network and one is the subcontractor network, but then, for this user, when I get all the resources, I actually want to get the resources from both of those networks and display them all together as if they're one network. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to move towards when it comes to things like chat and stuff as well. Like for this exporter, when they're online, they should be able to chat with everybody from their own network as well as everybody from the subcontractor network. And they shouldn't have to 
switch between the two networks in order to do that. It should just be part of their environment because they're connected to all of that. Uh, yeah, I might just pause there for a minute because uh, it's a complicated topic, but does that kind of make it clear what I'm aiming for? Not in the slightest. <laughs> Not in the slightest. <laughs> But it looks, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I think I'll get it. I just need a bit more time to, to process what it would do. And I think what would really benefit uh, me and both of us, I think we should maybe start working together a bit more on, um, like, how would you, have you got a UI for this at all? No, um, I'm pulling this together with tests at the moment. There is some UI stuff happening, but it's not really focused on these things. It's more simple than that at the moment. Yeah. Um, okay. So maybe what we could do is a simple is, is pick one of these um, parts that has a, a UI, and I could build a UI for it uh, um, that then hooks up to all of your all this um, DNA stuff. Because hmm, hmm. yeah, the beautiful thing about Holochain and View and stuff is that it's super modular. So you could, we could just build a I don't know, exporters list as as a control. As a, as a UI component um, using Chimera and just run your um, DNAs and DH, uh, DHTs in the, uh, in the conductor, obviously, and mm -hmm. make it work. Because what I, what I see is that, because ARIA is it's quite big, right? There's a lot, a lot of parts to it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the things that people see or interact with could be quite um, simple. Yeah. Yeah. My, my whole drive is around the um, music industry and organizing events and that kind of thing. So this is, this fits in perfectly into that. So I'm getting pretty close to being, uh, to starting to build the events module and that sort of, or the gig module, as you saw, saw before. And what I'd really like mm -hmm. to be able to look into doing is um, adding, is uh, using what you build here with REA and I'll build some UI parts for it. As a third party, I think that would be very cool. So, because mm. I feel like that's also what's been missing with REA. Like, I think for people to be able to play around with it without diving into your code. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very complicated underneath. Well, not that mm. It's not that complicated. It's just a lot of parts, a lot of small parts. Mm. If we start building some UI parts that fit into what I built for Chimera. Mm. Um, I think that that would that would be a really awesome outcome, actually. Mm. That's right. Yeah, um, I'm just trying to find some screenshots for you. I think they ended up in here. Yeah, this uh, no, no, not that one. Um, actually, I think what we'll do, Sam, is before mm. I continue on with what I'm doing with the gig management and that sort of stuff, let's catch up for a couple of hours and work out what uh, is already in REA that I could just basically put a UI front end on for what I need. Uh, yeah. Um, like I'm thinking the one that might be good to, to design, like if we want to, if we want to prove some kind of cross network thing, um, oops, that was the wrong button. I did not mean to stop sharing. Uh, Looking at um, you know these kinds of things like so this courier here they they've got their own courier network they've got the customers planning network so they've got a few different spaces where they're doing things and then the customer network they're responsible for like meeting a customer order and then their planning network they're responsible for managing the delivery and all that stuff um, so one useful app that we've been thinking about is like something that lets you manage all of your commitments and things you need to do across all of those collaboration spaces rather than being isolated to like, I'm in my, my logistics network. What are the things I need to do here? But like, where's my dashboard of all the things that I'm committed to do with, you know, all of the businesses I'm engaged with and my own personal life and all that stuff. Yeah. That's pretty much what I was, that's what I was designing last night. When I went for my walk was the tagging thing. Um, <clears throat> Sure, you could add tags to stuff, but you need to be able to go back from the tag and get everything that's associated to the tag. And you could have tagged anything, right? So, um, yeah, that's like 
we've got to be able to bring back all these different UIs to the different types of things that were tagged. Mm. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there's some other things in this list that are worth talking through today. Um, just a quick VR. question, Bosby. You mentioned yeah. focusing more on the GraphQL JavaScript part, but I couldn't get why the bridging between DNAs isn't as critical for what you built. Or is that uh, just... No, that's, that's there, but it's... Um, it's not the work that's needed to make the front end like really mm. seamless and easy to deal with multiple networks. Mm. Um, like we can, we can do all that stuff now. Like I can, I can write these tests now, mm. but I would only be able to interact with these DNAs through the GraphQL API. So when I'm doing customer.graphql and running GraphQL, it's only going to talk to those okay. core, those core named um, networks. Mm. And when I want to do, uh, like I get to the step here of um, where, you know, courier receives the order and accepts yeah. the offer. Like there's, there's steps here where it's actually users reading data out of one DNA and then saving them into another DNA. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that can just be like pulling data and putting it back. But yeah. I have to do it through like the low level zone call API because the graph mm. doesn't make it easy. Yeah. But I should ideally be able to just have one GraphQL API that lets me read a record and write it and GraphQL should figure out which DNAs the record needs to go to. Um, so basically like for the client app at the UI layer, managing the views and stuff, mm. it shouldn't make any difference whether I'm connected to 10 different networks or just one. Mm. Like I shouldn't have to change any code to, to make that change. It should just figure it out internally. When you're writing into another DHT and if it's another agent doing it, like wouldn't that permission have to be figured out at the Rust level? Like that validation code? Uh, well, there's two ways of doing it. Like the, the easy way would be to do it through the client and that's probably what I'll do for the moment. But then mm. the more complete way is to build, like I don't think it's a specific thing. I think there's maybe a generic DNA that we can plug in to do that kind of stuff. Um, mm. where it's like those operations of needing to automatically pass data on to another DNA. Mm. Um, but that, that could also be a very big job that gets into all kinds of like ontological translation and you know, being mm. able to translate data from one network space to another. So, and also yeah. the issues of bridging that are still unresolved. Uh, yeah, like I haven't... Um, I haven't but tried things in here yet for it, mm. uh, but like, you know, this one here, I mean, this, this test runs to the point it gets to. So building this configuration seems to work, mm. but um, like, and, and this way around is okay to have t a planning DNA bridging to an observation DNA and having a different mm. planning DNA bridging to an observation DNA, because that's mm -hmm. still a one-to-one -one binding from, planning to observation, which is what mm. the DNAs deal with. Um, but I can't set up multiple bindings from the same network. So I can't mm. like have uh, one planning space writing mm. to two observation spaces. Mm. Um, so they are those, those more complicated bridging things mm. aren't doable yet, but there's a, there's a simpler bridging set of things that can be done before then. That's a bit more complicated mm. than what we have now. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, maybe. Gonna, uh, sorry. I was just gonna. What's your plan for moving to the twenty twenty um, format for, for your Rust code? I have no plans yet. I'm just waiting for the code to stabilize. Yeah. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> um. There's maybe a couple of other things to speak to briefly on this. Um just as possibilities to think about, Philip. Uh, one is, um, you know, we talked in the early days quite a bit about having Juniper embedded as a gateway zone so that you've got GraphQL actually running out of Holochain rather than it being done in the browser. Um, I don't know if that's... That, to start, that was our first way of doing it. Yeah, um, and since I've got like the 
the templating stuff in the schemes here, you could actually use this templating to combine a bunch of schemas and generate slices of um, module sets for Juniper if you wanted to do that. Um, but that's maybe not so critical as the rest of these things. Uh, we've talked about that a bit. Um, this one, this kind of stuff would be an interesting thing to explore with Chimera, like um, DM's social triangul triangulation zone, he has this function here that gets settings from the DNA about you know, how many initial members are needed and how many vouchers are needed to join the DNA. Mm -hmm. um, you could actually have like some, you know, drop down that lets you select sets of behavior here in Chimera so that you can have an ability to plug in different behaviors for how the settings are managed and stored. <coughs> um, like this is the simple one of like they're from the DNA, but you might want settings that are managed by an admin or you might want settings that are managed by a quorum of votes or you, know, you can have all kinds of stuff. Um, and I don't know whether those would be easy to code as custom templates right at the moment, or if they have to be kind of more low level design, but um, that'd be cool. I think. Yeah, well, one of the big things about what we're doing here is um, how, do you, how do you make it easy for a, for a community to grow around it? Because at the moment, it's mm -hmm. pretty spot. So one of the big things I'm trying to do is, which is what I was doing with, the, with my websites, is I'm building websites for a bunch of uh, DJs and producers in Melbourne so that there is now a, a touch point for their community to join. And so the, the idea is, is that um, they'll have a website, which is just a static, uh, static website, and then it has a link on there to like, you know, chat. So if you hit the chat, you go from the static site to a holo hosted site and you have to do your holo login. And that creates the, an easy way to, uh, you know, create the community, which is where I see the social triangulation stuff happening as well. It's like, sure, okay, now you're on chat, but you know, do we trust you to come and you know move to the next level of you know, whatever that may be? Um, <clears throat> and I'm finding that just by building stuff, these um, these questions are, are getting answered as we go along, and especially a lot of this stuff's going to be much easier with the 2020 version as well. This is, um, oops, I want this one. Maybe it's even something that can be done as like a small project out of, out of Chimera. Um, but I can see us needing to do a lot of like permutations of DNA bundles on, on zones in the future. Um, I started doing, doing up a spec for group agents compatibility. Um, but then it's like there's, I can see all these different needs for different variations on just assembling the zones differently. So like a base group agent just has a group that people can register with. Um, and then you might want an agent that people can give each other capabilities in and a group agent um, that you can give capabilities to each other in based on a vote. Uh, like so, you know, and there's not really any custom code in a lot of these, um, especially ones like, you know, a group agent with subgroup is just the same as a group agent, but you also add an ability to register other groups. Um, yeah, I think I think we're going to have a lot of that kind of stuff as deployment options for zones, maybe um, if we want to do like predictable, verifiable bits of behavior. Like if you know if everyone is compiling their own zone from source or their own DNA from source or zone um, that mixes all this behavior, then there's going to be a different DNA hash and no predictability that it's all the same code. So having like ones that are published and well known that people can use and they're known to not be modified might be useful as well. Yeah. Um, it's actually one thing I'm building too is the um, once you once you finish building a part and you're happy with it, it's all done, is to then be able to like publish it. So that then um, other people can use it, and that'll you know that'll pull down the the um, the base DNA, and then you you know put in a um, a UUID or something like that to make it unique. But the, yeah, that's all coming soon. Hmm. I feel pretty complete. Hey, the rest of this might be kind of going into other tangents for this week. Yep. Cool. Well, that was really good. Um, 
uh, I look forward to catching up next week, actually. It's, I'm really quite happy with the speed at which, or the velocity, yeah, speed velocity, when I get business <laughs> tables, um, with which I'm getting through what I want to build. And it's kind of getting to the point where I've kind of built most of what I had in mind to start with. Now I want to like polish it and you know make it easier to use and you know keyboard binding and stuff like that so that it's so that I find it a really pleasant experience to use. And uh, the plan is that yeah when 2020 drops for the beta launch um, this will be ready to start smashing out lots of different apps. So shall we um do did go for a commitment management interface as a, a test in the next week, a fortnight? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, let's catch up and have you got any mock-ups of what it's meant to look like and that sort of thing? So you can... No, we can make it up. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah, okay, well, let's, let's catch up uh, early next week and have a chat about what that could be. Cool. And... Um, when can we, I keep, I ask you this every time, when can we play with it? CRISPR. Um, we can play with it now. Is it? You just, yeah. Oh. oh, then I should, maybe I should, um, cause I tried downloading and install it and it ran some issues, so maybe I should share them with you uh, the, the, the readme is not up to date <laughs> um okay we could, okay maybe yeah um, okay well, give me a few more days. You want to, maybe on like tuesday do you want to catch up and um we can walk through it together and yeah get you set up yeah let's do that because um my like i've just been i've also been browsing through the ratings part that you've created um and i think it'll be fun to just fork that into a bunch of different things and start playing with it. Yeah, yeah there's no yeah. DHTM on the other thing. Oh, is it not? Uh, I haven't actually hooked it up or anything. I've just... Mm. Mm. But yeah, but yeah if, that would be, like, I'd be very interested in helping build that. Okay. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Awesome. Can I just say a quick thing? I, um, thanks, guys. Uh, Philip, I don't know. I, look, I don't understand enough about uh, <laughs> about Hollow yet, about uh, some of the Zoom and DHT and so on. I mean, I understand what DHTs are. I spoke to... Uh, are you using Tonica or uh, Kademlia as a DHT? What does Holochain use? Uh, it's called Round Robin DHT, and it's our own patent. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, your UI stuff looks great. Looks like the future. It looks cool. And possibly uh, your REA stuff looks impressive. It's the first time I've sort of looked under the hood. So um, I'm, uh, I'm encouraged to go and do some more research so I know what you're talking about next time. Quick question. Are these calls every week? Should mm -hmm. I put it in my calendar? Yep. Um, I'll, I'll add you to the, to the weekly event. Great. So, thank you. Yeah. All right. And I just recommend popping into the Holochain forum. Like you just get a better sense of what's going on, and um, nice. like so when you hang out there, you get a yeah, you can see what's going going on across the ecosystem. Yeah, thanks guys, appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, great to have you. Okay, alrighty, all right, guys. Wanna, yeah, yeah, give us a call on Tuesday, see them. We'll, we'll yeah. set it up and see. What Perfect. Awesome. Right. See you guys. Ciao. Bye.